Hey guys, we're incredibly lucky today to have Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the Allergy and Infectious Disease Branch of the NIH. You may have seen him on stage with Trump as he's part of the Coronavirus Task Force. He's gonna be answering some of our questions today. Let's get right to it. Dr. Mike, how are you? How's it going? <laughs> Running around like a maniac here, but other than that, I'm good. I can only imagine. I heard your uh, wife was forcing you to get at least four or five hours of sleep. I'm proud of her for doing that. Yes, four hours is all I'm doing, but she's the one that's doing it. She's the one that's doing it. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Well, first of all, let me say a huge thank you for joining us uh, on the YouTube channel. Everyone in the YouTube community really appreciates what you're doing. My whole channel is about fact-checking, putting out accurate info, and you've essentially become the face for that. So huge thanks from all of us for that. Okay. Um, let's start by talking about social distancing. Um, it's something that I've explained to my audience that's incredibly important. That's how we control the spread of this virus, the run on hospitals. There's been a lot of talk recently about curtailing that. I'm curious not so much about the date because as you said, the virus doesn't have a timeline. What are What is the yardstick that we're gonna be using to measure when it may be safe to curtail the social distancing? Is it number of those who are ill, fatalities, a hospital preparedness, what say you? Well, it's a combination of things and it's gonna be different through different regions of the country because you can't look at it as unidimensional. I mean, New York is clearly different from uh, Washington and it's clearly different from Alabama. But the in direct answer to your question, you look at two things. You look at the kinetics of the outbreak when you're in the middle of an outbreak. So once it starts reaching that point of plateauing a bit and coming down, you don't want to stop the social distancing, but you may be able to relieve the restrictions on movement in order to get basic supplies to people so that they're not just locked down. If you have an area that has very few cases, what you want to do is you want to test a lot in that area to get a feel for what the penetrance of the virus is. And when you get an individual case, you want to immediately identify it, isolate it, contact trace it and get it out of society. If you do that efficiently, you may be able to open up that community because you're doing good containment. You know, the two major pillars are containment where you try to stop the spread. And the other is mitigation. When you say, oh my goodness, it's here. What are we gonna to do to prevent it from getting worse? Do you think that there would be any conditions where you think politicians may act too soon and start saying, let's start opening up some of these restrictions? What would happen in, in a red alert type scenario like that? Well, I think that would be unfortunate. And that's the thing that we, that we advise against. If you do open up too soon, you could have the perverse effect that in, as it's going this way, then it starts going back up. Sure. And then you essentially compound the need for the kind of things, respirators, ventilators, hospital beds, ICU, things like that. You've talked a little bit about seasonality, the possibility that this virus may go away for the summer, may return in the fall, certainly not a definite. But if that were to happen, what preparations can we take as ordinary citizens for the fall? And myself as someone who's on the front lines as a family medicine doctor, what can we do? Okay, first of all, if that happens, and to be honest with you, I think it's going to happen, mm -hmm. I really don't see something as robustly transmitted as this disappearing the way SARS did. Particularly if we start to see an increase in infections in the Southern Hemisphere, Southern Africa, places like that, now as they enter their winter, which means for sure a cycle will come back. That means that as we go down in our cases, We've got to use that time to prepare that it doesn't happen to us to the extent that it did the first time around. That's why we've got to do the vaccine development that we're doing. We've got to do clinical trials in drugs, randomized controlled trials that prove things work as opposed to maybe they're going to work. Those are the things that we need to do, as well as get the kind of testing capabilities so that you can do good containment without waiting until it gets into mitigation. We may have a window and it's not gonna be over. We're gonna breathe a sigh of relief when it starts to go down, but we need to gird ourselves that it may come back. You mentioned the clinical trials. There's hundreds of clinical trials going on right now, testing all sorts of combinations. Uh, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, even plasma transfusions are all on the table. I know that we don't have any randomized controlled results yet. Uh, do you have uh, a medication or a treatment that you think is a front runner at this time? 
Well, you know, we have a remdesivir trial that we do have a randomized controlled trial. And I would hope that within the next couple of months or less, and I would say or less, we're either going to get an efficacy signal, then we can say, well, let's do it. Let's let it rip with that drug. Or we're going to get nothing. And then we'll say, get it off the table and stop wasting time. Sure. But I think that's going to be reasonably soon. Okay. And also the plasma transfusions, immune globulin, those kinds of things, monoclonal antibodies, they're all going to be going into testing. Okay. Um, I, I, when I meant about the randomized controlled studies, that we don't have the results to those studies yet, because that's why it's difficult to pick a front no, runner. Yeah. We, we don't have the results. Yeah. The N is got not big enough yet. When we get a big enough N, we'll know. Absolutely. We need them powered. Young people, they seem to be more affected, or at least that's what the media is telling us here in the United States. Is that true? And if so, why here more than in China? That's a good question. Everybody knows that the original China data made it look like young people virtually never uh, got involved in a serious way. Then as we start getting into Italy, looking a little bit more like us, France, European countries and ourselves, we're starting to see individuals in their 30s and 40s. Now, if you look at them, still many of them have underlying conditions, even though they're 30 or 40. They have diabetes, they have uh, hypertension, they have things like that. But if you look closely, you will see that there are young people who are otherwise well, who can get seriously ill. So we need to forget this, that if you're young, you're good to go, you have no problem. There are two issues with younger people you need to consider. A, you need to avoid infection, just like everybody else, not only for your own health, but even if you get trivially involved, you can be a vector that would ultimately infect someone who does have a real risk of serious conditions. It's kind of like the young, healthy 25-year-old gets infected, goes home, infects grandma and grandpa, or a 40-year-old uncle who has metastatic disease on chemotherapy. That's the problem. There's been some talk about the possibility of reinfection with COVID-19. Now, do you think that this is more an issue with testing, that the test remains positive, or are they truly being infected for a second time with the virus? You know, I don't know the, the answer to that 100%, but I would be willing to bet on my experience, and I'll bet your experience, that any virus that you have, if you do well, recover and clear the virus, if it acts like any other virus, you're going to have lasting immunity. Sure. You're not going to get reinfected. Yeah, you're the way just... the way that I've thought about it is there's certain illnesses where you get lifelong immunity, chicken pox, measles with your two vaccinations. So maybe this won't be lifelong immunity, but to say there is none where you can get reinfected in two oh. weeks, something seems off. No, that's inconceivable yeah. to me that that's the case. Okay. I mean, you're going to have some degree of durable immunity. You're right. It may not be 50 years, but it's certainly going to be a matter of a few years. Sure. Right. Um, for myself as a healthcare provider, this is something my hospital system even asked me to ask you. When is it safe for us to return to work once we've either tested positive for COVID-19 or, you know, with a lack of testing kits, had an upper respiratory viral illness where we don't know if it was COVID-19? When can we return? Is it when fever subsides, 24 hours after fever subsides, or do we do a full 14-day or 21-day quarantine? If you are a healthcare provider, or someone who is in a critical infrastructure and you need to get back to work, to assume that you're infected, what you can do is that you can wear a mask, take your temperature daily, monitor yourself if you get symptoms, get out of circulation. If not, assume you're infected, but do it in a way where you don't infect anybody else. Otherwise, every one of our healthcare providers are getting exposed every day. They can't assume they're infected. They've just got to go to work. And that's one of the things we're going to be recommending. Makes sense. That brings me to the topic of personal protective equipment, N95 masks. As recently as last week, my hospital was in need of these donations. Uh, I actually went on a journey to purchase $50,000 worth of masks myself from construction workers and was able to donate them. Why do you think uh, there's such a shortage? I, obviously, there's huge demand because we need to constantly be using these masks. New York Presbyterian Hospital System, they use 40 to 70,000 masks a day. But do you also think there's an issue of hoarding here or some sort of customs issue of getting these masks shipped over? It's a combination of all of the above. So one of the things that we really got to get away from was we got to make testing in a way that doesn't have the tester consume PPE. PPE should be for the people who are taking care of sick patients. And right now, we've got to have a system where a person can self 
stick the swab in, put it in the vial, give it to somebody, and nobody puts PPE on so you don't waste it. That's the first thing. The second thing, we've got to keep manufacturing it at a very, very high level. I mean, there was no anticipation that it would be so many people would need this. So we've got to get people who don't need it to not use it, and we've got to get a lot more for the people who need it. Speaking of those types of quick testing, um, for point-of-care testing, for those rapid tests, do you see that coming sooner rather than later? For us in the family practice setting, we have the influenza swabs that in 15 minutes we have an answer. Is there something like that on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, I was at the, you know, I go to these task force meetings at the White House every day. Yep. I was at one last evening. That was a topic of conversation. How are we going to scale these up and get these going? I can't give you a time frame, but there's a lot of enthusiasm about getting the private sector to really scale that up. America and Italy seem to be disproportionately affected to other nations that are even closer to Wuhan, China, which seems to be the epicenter or the original epicenter of this virus. Why do you think that this happened here in the U.S. and in Italy so much so than other nations? Well, you know, I think because people travel here and travel to Europe and Italy a lot, I think we really saved ourselves a real bad bullet, if you want to call that, by very quickly shutting down the uh, influx of cases from China. And then something that was very controversial, you might remember, when we shut down influx from Europe, because, you know, Europe is the new China. There's some numbers that you may be aware of that are really extraordinary about 60% of all the infections now, you know, in, in, in New, if you talk about New York City, how we're getting influx from, 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 uh, from uh, other countries, particularly China, that's how New York got hit so badly. New York, I mean, I mean I'm a New Yorker, in case you haven't seen it <laughs> from my accent. But, you know, about 56% of the new infections right now in our country are in New York City. New York City has more than half of the action. It's a big city. It's a robust city. People come and go. I think that's the reason why the United States is getting hit because of the kind of country we are. It makes sense. And I, you know, I live a few blocks away from Times Square. My windows actually look at Times Square. And I think there's also a statement to something to celebrate, the fact that there's so much solidarity. This past Saturday, 9 p.m., there wasn't a soul in Times Square. The fact that we are coming together and doing the social distancing is not something talked about in media. And I think it should be highlighted. We are doing a good job, uh, especially under these crazy circumstances. Would you agree? I, I totally agree. I, I, I was going to say I am amazed, but that's the wrong word. Uh, I'm impressed. Uh, uh, Proud. I shouldn't, be amazed. <laughs> I shouldn't be amazed because the American spirit is amazing. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, what I see here in Washington, D.C. is the same thing. I mean, people are doing things uh, in, in a calm way that I just think is wonderful. Uh, for sure. Really is. Really is. Agree. And my final question is, any guidance for us as physicians and what role do you think it plays in filling out death certificates? I fill these out before for my patients when I have done death pronouncements as a resident. Um, you know, if a patient has CHF, they come in with a congestive heart failure exacerbation, but they also have a, a viral illness at the time. What should go on the death certificate? Is it clinical judgment and what role do you think that plays in the numbers? You know, I think it's going to influence the numbers. I think you've got to make it clear. If someone obviously comes into it with acute respiratory distress syndrome and dies on a, on a ventilator, you know, that's coronavirus disease. Sure. <laughs> you've got to make sure it gets onto the death certificate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I've seen countries that have been uh, having low numbers of COVID-19 mortality, but then their numbers of pneumonia cases spike. And it's, are you just changing what's on the death certificate there? Right. And that's impacting those numbers. Right. right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. Very much appreciate your time and everything you've done for our nation. Uh, you're a voice of reason in a much needed time. Thank you. It's very much of a pleasure to be with you. Keep up your good work. Thank you. In the trenches is important. Keep yes. it up. Dr. Fauci is amazing at fact checking, especially presidents. He served six of them. Now, I, I tried my hand at fact checking politicians. Click on the video here, or if you want to have a good laugh, click here.